evening. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us, Pastor Bill Emmons, here at Covenant Faith Center in Chatsworth, California. We have a blessed day today. The smoke from the fires is clearing up, and I actually saw a little bit of blue sky, and uh, that was nice. <laughs> so good to have you with us, and uh, going to get into some word here in a, in a couple minutes. I uh, want to give people a chance to get, get tuned in. Uh, I've got to get, let's see, I've got to go to one of my Facebook channels or pages and um, uh, I've got to post it over on the other one. So give me a minute to find it and then we'll get on with things. Okay, so there it is. And I'm going to copy it. I talk when I do these things so I remember the steps I've got to take. All right, now we go to my Facebook page, and we paste. All right, now, should be coming in on May 5th. There we go, there's my Facebook page. And we are live. Hallelujah. Okay, so, looks like everything's working. We're live on Facebook on Covenant Faith Center, Chatsworth, California, Facebook page, and on William E. Emmons' Facebook page. Uh, and all of you that are on there, you already know that. Uh, we're live on Periscope, and we're live on Twitter. So, is there anything on there that you... No. Oh, okay. Uh, so, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, I want to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, get going with the Bible study tonight. But we welcome you. Glad that you're with us. Hope you stay around till the end. We're only an hour long. So hope you stay around till we're done because I believe I'll have some good things to share with you throughout the course of this study. So Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that it's that name that gives us access to your presence. And we know that we don't have to pray long, lengthy prayers, religious prayers, but simply, Father, talk to you because that name gave us access. So, Father, we come boldly before your throne of grace. And we come to obtain help and mercy in time of need. So, Father, tonight we ask for your help as we minister your word. We ask for the Holy Spirit to rise up and give me utterance and prepare the hearts and minds of the hearers to not only hear with their hearts, but to receive with a commitment to do the word. Holy Spirit, I thank you for causing whatever gifts that are needed to minister to the people tonight to manifest. I thank you for the glory of the Lord manifesting in this Bible study. I thank you that even though we may not see it physically right here, that signs and wonders are mir and miracles are being accomplished through the Word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit tonight. So we thank you for that. And Father, we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me read our foundational scripture here. Uh, from Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. If you haven't read that, you ought to go to Josh Joshua chapter 1 and read uh, verses 1 through 9, and it'll really give you some good insight. But I, in here, in verse 8, there's what I look at as an equation for success, for prosperity, for wisdom. And it says, This book of the law, which is the word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do all that's written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous, you shall deal wisely, and you shall have good success. So there's the equation right there. If you want to prosper, deal wisely, and have good success, then meditate the Word, get the revelation knowledge from that as you, by the Holy Spirit revealing things to you, and then begin to act on it, become a doer of the Word, and the blessings then begin to follow. Amen. Uh, I want to also uh, go ahead and read Psalm 91, because I know a lot of people don't read it every day, but this is a habit you ought to get into because it will help you, it will bless you, it will encourage you. So Psalm 91 from the Amplified Translation, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, I shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. On Him I lean and rely, and in him I confidently trust. Therefore, he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. 
He will cover me with his pinions, and under his wings shall I trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to me. I shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor the arrow and the evil plots and the slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death of surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. You ought to be declaring that. It shall not come near you. Only a spectator shall I be, myself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High God, as I witness the reward of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord my refuge and the Most High my dwelling place, there shall no evil befall me, nor any plague or calamity come near my dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over me to accompany and defend and preserve me in all my ways of obedience and service. They shall bear me up on their hands, lest I dash my foot against a stone. I shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent shall I trample underfoot, because I have, uh, uh, let's see, uh, <laughs> because I have set my love upon him, therefore will he deliver me, he will deliver me, he will set me on high, because I know and understand and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, and kindness, and I trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake me, no, never. I shall call upon him, and he will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me and honor me. With long life, he will satisfy me and show me his salvation. That's Psalm 91. It's one of the... Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite scriptures to use as a confession of faith and I uh, want to encourage you to uh, start doing that on a daily basis and like I said it will encourage you it will build your hope and your vision and help your faith to be stronger amen um, for those of you that don't know much about our ministry uh, we are a church here in Chatsworth California but obviously through the internet we are ministering around the world and um, so we welcome you know people to join in on our Bible studies from all over the world. Uh, the motto that, that is represents our ministry is um, up here on our well you can't see the banner but we have a banner over here and it's healing, hurting people, restoring hope, and building strong believers. That's exactly what we're here to do, and uh, we're doing our best to do that, and I believe God is honoring that. And I believe people are being set free. Amen. Uh, one last announcement. Uh, I know that there's a lot of Christians out there who don't know where to get their news from. And if and you know this probably already. If you listen to the secular news, chances are you're going to hear nothing but uh, wrong information regarding President Trump, the administration, politics, uh, even people running for office. So I want to encourage you. The Bible says, be careful what you are listening to. And so I want to make sure that, uh, that I share with you that we have some outlets where you can get good, solid information as well as uh, uh, a, an unbiased view of it in the sense that they're going to give you the straight truth. But also, uh, some of these will give you a Christian perspective on things. So uh, any of these can be found on Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, so I'm going to start with Lance Wall now. Some of you may know who he is. Uh, really deals with a lot of current issues. The Daily Wire, Breitbart News, Fox News Online, not the Fox News on your television, uh, the Western Journal, CNSNews.com, CBN News, Sean Hannity, which many of you may already know his name, Ben Shapiro, uh, ACLJ.com, that's a J Secular Live on Facebook, and Danish D'Souza. And they'll give you some great information that will help you to understand what's going on and uh, be able to have an intelligent viewpoint and uh, not only make intelligent decisions when it comes to the elections, but also uh, conduct an intelligent conversation with people because you have actual information, real information that can help. So I wanted to share that with you and uh, 
I believe that'll help you. All right, so we're going to recap briefly from uh, where we ended up last week. Uh, these, the subject, Satan's tools to stop your faith. The Bible says we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. And if we don't know how the devil works, then we don't know when he's attacking. And I know in traditional Christianity, a lot of times God gets the blame for things he never had a hand in. And, uh, you know, we, I hear people say all the time, well, you know, God's in charge, so whatever happens, that's God's will. That's not true. God put us in charge. And God waits for us to move in faith before he can respond. And if we don't move in faith, he can't respond to our situation. And just praying prayers like, oh, God, save the world. Well, he's trying. He sent Jesus. He did all he can do. It's up to mankind, who's a free moral agent, to make decisions. And when people reject Jesus Christ, they reject God. Uh, they reject all that he is and all he represents. And there's nothing he can do to override their decision. So we need to understand that God leaves a lot of these things in our hands. And we need to remember that so that we don't get confused. John 10.10 10 gives us the dividing line. And it's pretty clear. Jesus himself said the thief is not Jesus and not God and not the Holy Spirit. The thief is the devil. The thief cometh for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I came to give you life, and that in abundance. So there's your dividing line. If it's stealing, killing, and destroying, we know it's not God. If it's life, and that in abundance, then we know it is God. So you have to divide everything right. The Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you don't rightly divide it, then you're going to have wrong information and wrong ideas about God. You end up blaming God. Well, God's just testing me. Well, if you go to James, the Bible says that God doesn't tempt, test, try, or tribulate any man. So we have to, how do you reconcile that? you got to understand, God is not testing you to see whether or not you're going to make it. He's not testing you, trying you, or tribulating you. He's not making you sick uh, to, to strengthen your faith or to put you in the hospital so you can witness to somebody next to you. That's all unscriptural. That's religious stuff. That's not true. That's why we go to the Word of God. Amen? So, some of the devil's devices, and, and just a brief recap, forgetting to remember, and that sounds kind of strange, uh, but for Psalm 77, verse 11, I will earnestly recall the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will earnestly remember the wonders you performed for our fathers of old. And, and throughout the Bible, there's so many scriptures, and before we're done, we're going to read a, a bunch more that deal with that. And all these writers in the, in the Bible have made similar comments, similar statements, that we need to remember the things that God has done. And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying just what he's done for us, because you may feel like God's never done a thing for you. But go back and remember, and all the way back in the Old Testament, even in 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 Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned and they, they, they died spiritually, God still provided a covenant blessing for them. And then we go, you know, to all the different uh, generations after that, and you can go through the Bible and, and look after uh, person after person that has a testimony of what God did for them. And we need to remember that because if God did it for them and he's no respecter of persons, He'd be willing to do it for us. All we got to do is believe him. Amen? Uh, one of the devil's tactics that he uses against us is causing us to forget what God, what God has done, as I've just stated, which also causes us to forget the things he promised he would do. If you don't remember what he's done, then when you read the New Testament and he says he will do certain things, it's hard sometimes for a person to accept that that's truth and to believe that. If they don't even remember what God has done in the past, then what he's saying he'll do now is really no different than what he did hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, going back to the beginning. So we need to remember what God has done so that when we start looking at the New Testament, we can believe that what he promises there, he'll also do for us. Well, the other, that, it, that Psalm 91 we just read, by the way, is a good thing to go and look at in regards to what I just said. Um, one of his weapons that he used against us is, uh, again, it's, it's really our own memory where we don't choose to 
remember so we forget. And he uses that against us. So forgetting um, that attacks against you, spiritual attacks, physical attacks, uh, that, that lead to problems, challenges, uh, hurt, uh, anxiety, fear, whatever it may be, that these are not attacks just solely against you. These are actually attacks against the Word of God. And that the devil wants to do, uh, what one, one of the big things he wants to do is he wants to uh, try and prove to you that the Word of God does not work. And so he attacks you in order to attack the Word to try to prove to you it doesn't work. Well, like Paul said, after having done all, stand. We stand in faith, even if we don't see the results right now. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So that's why we, where we get this declaration, I'm not moved by what I see, I'm not moved by what I feel, I'm moved by what I believe. And I believe the Word of God as a choice. I choose to believe what God said. The Bible says that he's not a man that he should lie. And I can go back and read all these things and see what he's done, that he's kept his word. If he'll keep his word to them, he'll keep his word to us. One of the, in that Mark chapter 4, verses 14 through 20, good reference for you. Um, here's another thing we talked about last week. We forget that the amount of word, the word of God, the amount of word we place in us, and acted on and declared with our mouths, because that's where faith is released, with your words, will determine the amount of results you get with your faith. And I know people over the years that, you know, they came into the faith teaching and they were really excited at first. Uh, it didn't go along with a lot of traditional teaching, uh, but it was scriptural. Uh, and they jump in and they get excited and they begin to you know, do things without taking the time to build the faith and the word in their hearts so it would build faith. And then after a while when the pressure comes and things don't work for them, they walk away. They quit. And uh, the, when, they, when they do that, they get an attitude many times. And I've heard them say, well, I tried that faith stuff, but it didn't work. No, faith always works. You need to understand that. Faith always works. It's what you do that relates to faith as to whether or not it's going to work. The more words you have in you, the more that you uh, meditate and act on that word, because James says be a doer of the word. Joshua, we read, tells us to be a doer of the word. The, the more words you have in you that you act on and that you're willing to declare will determine the amount of results you get. So I have to first get in the Word and let the Word get in me through meditating on it, studying it. And then as I meditate on it, by the word, the word, the, by the way, the word meditate there is the, uh, in the Greek, it's the word rhema, and it literally deals with speaking the Word. That doesn't mean going around uh, quoting Scripture. It's taking a word and making a declaration of faith out of it, like we did with, with Psalm 91, where you uh, take a word and you put it in a first-person uh, format so that you're declaring it for yourself. What happens is, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. As you meditate, which is speaking forth that word as a confession over your life, that will build faith. Faith cometh. The more you declare it, the more will come. All right, That will build your faith. It will also build your vision or hope. Okay, As you do that and then you make a determination to act on that word, to be a doer of the word, that's the first two big steps in moving towards results. And of course the third part of that is your declaration of faith, which if you're meditating the word, then you're going to be speaking faith. But at some point you take those promises and you turn them into a declaration of your faith for that situation. And, and as you put those three actions together, meditate the word, do the word, and declare it over your situation, then you'll begin to see results. Now nobody says it'll happen overnight. Sometimes it does. But that's where Paul says, after having done all, then stand. How long do you stand? As long as it takes to get the results. 
we need to quit being quitters. <laughs> get that. Stop being quitters and start being standards. We stand. We don't quit. We don't lay down and wave a white flag. That's when you let the devil run over you and he just tries to prove to you that stuff doesn't work. Oh, you know, faith doesn't work. The word doesn't work. Prayer doesn't work. Well, I got news for you. It does. We've been living this for 47 years and it's been working. And I can't go, I can't look at it and say I can't see God's hand in our lives. I see it all the way through the last 47 years. So take, take our testimony and then go into the Word and do what we do. Amen? All right. So another one of the things that, uh, that and I'm getting into new material tonight, that uh, we need to remember. So we've been talking about what we forget, how the devil will use uh, our forgetfulness to hinder us. But sometimes it's also a matter of us not choosing to remember, not choosing to go back and look at what, like I said, what God said already, what God's done already. But one of the things we need to remember is that what's in your heart, you put there. Now, I'll explain that. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm going to read those verses to you here in a minute. Out of the abundance of the heart, what you put in is going to determine what comes out under pressure. And you can quickly tell when people are feeding on the Word of God on a regular basis when they get under pressure. Somebody cuts them off going down the road, how do they respond? How do you respond? You stub your toe in the middle of the night in the dark when you're getting up to go to the restroom or something or go to the refrigerator and get something to eat and you stub your toe, what's the word, what kind of words come out of your mouth? Uh, the times when you, when pressure hits you will help you to understand what's in your heart because what's in your heart will come out of your mouth with words. So if you find that your responses to things are not what they ought to be, they're not words of faith, they're not words of trust, they're not words of victory, then you have to put other things in your spirit, in your heart, all right? So when you meditate on the Word of God, as I already discussed, that is placing the Word on deposit in your heart. The only thing you can draw out of your heart is what you put on deposit. If you've been living in the world, you get born again tonight, there's still a bunch of junk on deposit in your heart. And you've got to get that stuff out, and in your mind as well. You've got to renew your mind. But as you spend more time meditating on the Word of God and declaring it with your mouth, you'll discover that when pressure comes, that out will come the Word. And I'll give you an example. I've used this before, but it's worth using it again. A good testimony is a good testimony no matter how many times you share it. <laughs> when I worked in the steel mills, I was what they called a fitter who's a fitter is like a carpenter, except you're building things out of steel. You're welding, you're hammering, you know. So I was working on 145 foot long bridge girders. Uh, we probably drive on some of the bridges I helped build uh, during those times uh, when I worked, worked in the steel mill. And um, in when building a, a girder for a bridge, uh, you, you've seen the H pattern. You've got a flange, a web, and a flange. And then between the flange, top flange and bottom flange, they put steel stiffeners. We weld those in, and that keeps the, the web from flexing and collapsing. Not that that's important to you. But you build them laying down. And so uh, when, we're, when we were putting these stiffeners in, you do a tack weld, and you take a, a sledgehammer, and you hit the stiffener, and it kind of cements the, the web to the stiffener. It closes the gap on a hot weld. The weld cools and it stays there. Then they go back and weld the whole thing. All that just to get to the point of what happened. I was holding the stiffener up. You have to hold them because they don't hold themselves. I was holding it and I've been doing this for quite some time and I missed, judged my, my distance. Did the tack weld. You got to move pretty quick. You do the tack weld, drop it, pick up your hammer and bam like that. Well, I was holding it and I came down on my finger right here and it tore the flesh 
away. I mean, I don't know how, how deep it was. It looked like it almost went to the bone. It was so much hanging over. Blood started coming out. And uh, I had a welding glove on. And I, so I didn't know that at first, what happened. But boy, I'll tell you, it hurt. And a lot of times, people would do things like that. And they'd say, oh, you know, and you fill in the blank. What came out of my mouth was, in the name of Jesus. I didn't stop and think. That was in me in abundance, and I'm not, it's not because I'm religious, it's because I spent time meditating on God's promises and the power of the name of Jesus, and I, that's what come out under pressure. Well, I pulled the glove off, I saw what it was, I went over to a sink, I washed it off, I, I folded that flesh back up on there and went to the uh, office where the medical staff was, and they, you know, they gave me something and covered it up and put a bandit on I went back to work well now if, if you were here and you could see there is no evidence of any scar or anything there to show that anything ever happened and my wife can tell you I didn't go around cussing and talking about how much it hurt and oh it's throbbing and I can't sleep actually once it was bandaged up I was fine I went back to work and and you know after a few days it was all mended back up but it, it clearly showed me what was in me because out, come, out came in the name of Jesus. Well, <laughs> what comes out of you under pressure? What comes out of you when you get a late bill? Uh, when, when, like I said, somebody scratches your car or any number of other things. <clears throat> that, determ that lets you know what's in you. So, let me read Matthew 12, 34. I've already quoted it from the Amplified Translation, you offspring of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil or wicked? For out of the fullness, the overflow, the superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, he's saying, how can you talk good things when your heart is full of evil things? And that's true. A sinner doesn't talk godly things because that what's in their hearts, what they've been talking, and is evil things. So we have to change what's in our heart. Now the word heart there is really dealing with our spirit man. The Bible says that out of the spirit, the heart again, flow the forces of life. What creates life in this body? The spirit man. Without the spirit, the body falls to the ground dead. Uh, it, it has no life in it. It's the spirit that gives life. So we have to feed the spirit man. And the way we do that is we feed on the word of God. We meditate on it. And that gives us spiritual strength. So when we do that, we're putting the word on deposit. When pressure comes, instead of, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my home. Uh, I might lose my job. That's, that's fear. And if that's what's in you, then you need to change what's in you. What we need to do is put the word on deposit in our spirit. The word is spiritual food. One writer says, I desire your word God more than my necessary food in the New Testament we read a scripture that says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God so there is that place where we need spiritual nourishment for our spirit man to be strong now verse 35 says the good man from his inner good treasure or one translation says deposit flings forth and again another translation says flings forth into existence. There's creative things going on here. Flings forth into existence good things. <clears throat> and an evil man, out of his inner evil storehouse or deposit, flings forth into existence evil things. When you say things like, you know, I just, uh, it never fails. I just get going good on a job and I get laid off or I get fired. You're bringing forth evil things. You know, well, you know, I go and buy a car and just, you know, before I hardly get out the driveway, somebody bangs into it. You're flinging forth evil things, and that's what's manifesting in your life. you got to start talking good over your stuff, over your life, over your body, over your family. Amen? All right. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, we're in the same place there. He said, but I tell you, on the day of judgment, now let me stop there. The day of judgment is not the great white throne judgment we stand before God. That's not it. 
The day of judgment. See, the devil is now putting judgment on you. Every time you talk doubt, fear, and unbelief, the devil is putting judgment on you, and he takes advantage of that. So when the attacks come against you, that's what he's talking about. That's the day of judgment. I tell you, on the day of judgment, men, men will have to give account for every idle, inoperative, non-working word they speak. What words are you speaking? Because the words you speak will allow the devil's attacks against you to work or it'll stop the devil's attacks against you. Verse 37 says, For by your words you will be justified and acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned and sentenced. So the devil is trying to hold court over you. He tries to put guilt and condemnation on you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he, he's a legalist, so he brings legal accusations against you based upon what you've been doing, what you've been saying, and so forth. And then he puts judgment on you because if you open the door through your words and actions of unbelief, he has a legal right to attack you. So many of the attacks that you've gone through have been the result of the words you've been speaking. So let's not give him that legal right. Let's shut that door, okay? Let's make sure that the words we speak are words that are grounded in and on the Word of God. So we fill our spirit man with spiritual food and strength, which is faith, and then we declare when the pressure comes out of our mouth comes a declaration or a statement of faith. You know, you do something like when I hit my hand, well, by his stripes I was healed, therefore I am healed. There's been many things the devil's tried to put on my body over the years that have been alarming in the natural, but my response is, by his stripes I was healed therefore I am healed I even say that if I take an aspirin uh, I, I, I very rarely have a headache uh, you know but there are those occasions maybe I didn't get enough sleep which is the biggest cause I've seen uh, or maybe I've eaten too much chocolate that can do it sometimes but other than that I, I hardly ever you know have that problem I hardly ever get a headache but if I do, and I go take an aspirin just to deal with the symptoms temporarily, I also say I'm redeemed from the curse, therefore I'm redeemed from headaches that are under the curse. And in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. Headache, I command you to go. I know I take the aspirin, I receive it by faith, it's sanctified, made health and nourishment to my body without any harmful effects, only good effects. And then I go about my business, and usually, within minutes, that headache will be gone. And I have to look back and contribute it not to the aspirin so much as to the faith that I put out there because the aspirin wears off and that headache does not come back. So I'm just kind of sharing with you some you know, things that, that we've learned to do. All right, so your words will determine your outcome ultimately. Feeding on the word will give you the ability to have faith. Speaking the word will give you the ability to have victory. You need to go from having faith. I've heard people say, well, I got all the faith in the world, but they're talking unbelief, which tells me they really don't have all the faith in the world, because if they did, they'd be talking it, all right? Uh, when you catch people and they're casual, you know, that they're in a casual situation, you find out pretty quick that uh, they may not be as strong in faith as they claim to be. Uh, I've been around people in our congregation that, um, you know, in the church, boy, they're, they're talking faith and they're believing God and they're making declarations and testimonies and stuff like that. You get outside the church and you're going for lunch or you're going to play a game of golf or, uh, you know, go do some activity somewhere. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, you find things coming out of their mouths that you look at them and say, man, where, where's that coming from, you know? Uh, you're not supposed to be talking like that. You're a believer. Well... What you put in determines what comes out. It goes back to, uh, back in the, uh, it's still true, but in the early days when computers first became available to the public, and I remember, well, back in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I got my first computer, uh, I think it was the late 70s, it was a Radio Shack computer. I got a book about that thick, and it was, it was empty, there was nothing there and I had to do my own programming. I had to read the book and learn how to program 
and write a program for the computer. So I, I wrote a word processing program, and I wrote a, um, a math uh, for bookkeeping kind of program, and, and that's as far as I wanted to go. <laughs> but one of the things we learned back then was, uh, and the statement goes, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you enter in, if it's garbage, what's going to come out is garbage. If you enter in just a bunch of keystrokes, and, and what, it, what comes out is going to be the same thing. It's not going to change just because you entered it. What you put in you determines what comes out under pressure. Amen. All right. So let's let's continue on. Uh, in Numbers, chapter 14, verse 28 from the Amplified Translation, this is an example of what I'm talking about. God is speaking. This is after uh, when, when Israel came out of Egypt, they finally got to where they could cross over to the promised land, they sent in 12 spies. And Joshua and Caleb were two of the 12 spies, and, and they spied out the land. And they gathered up some of the fruits and, and you know to bring back as testimony to what was there. So they got back, and the uh, Joshua and Caleb, they gave their testimony of what they saw, and, and, and they said, uh, let's go up at once and take it, for we are well able. Basically, they said what God said. I have given you the land. And they said, God gave it to us, let's go get it. The other ten spies, in Hebrews, it says they gave an evil report. And what did they do? They said, well, the land is a big land. Uh, it's a hard land. Uh, it swallows up its inhabitants. Uh, oh, by the way, there's giants there. And there's big walled cities. Those, those cities of giants were big walls because they knew there were other giants. And, um, uh, you know, they're, they're talking all the negative. They didn't look at what God had promised. It was there. Everything God promised was there. Instead, they looked at all the negative, and when they came back, that was their report. They, they said, uh, we're like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we were in theirs. In other words, your attitude about yourself determines other people's attitude about you. And they were talking their unbelief. They said, we can't take up, we, we can't take this land. We're not able. And so it says that the whole of Israel began to cry all night long. And then the next day it, they began to speak. And they said, you know, it would have been better if we stayed in Egypt and died there. Of course, they were in bondage. They were slaves. So I'm not sure why they think that would be, be better. They said, or it would be better if we died here in the wilderness than to try and take that land. God speaks here in Numbers 14. He responds in verse 28. Tell them as I live, says the Lord, what you have said, what you have spoken in my hearing, that will I have to allow. Now the, uh, the Amplified and the King James says, that will I do to you. But the correct translation there is based upon a causative permissive verb, which means God was caused to allow. And, and so it should read like this. I will have to allow to be done unto you. In other words, what you have said, I have to allow. Well, we can get into some other study that we've already talked about before, but in the beginning, what, what position did Adam and Eve have in the earth? They had dominion and authority. He turned over his handiwork, Psalm 8, verse 2 and on, talks about, the writer says, what, what is man that you're mindful of him? that you would place all your handiworks under his authority. Now I'm paraphrasing. But you go back and read it, and that's what it says. God gave the dominion over this earth, this creation, to mankind. Mankind, being Adam and Eve at that time, lost it. And for 4,000 years, the devil ruled over man, if I can say it this way, with an iron fist. But the, the reality is, that Jesus won it back. When he came to the disciples and he said, All power, dominion, and authority in heaven and earth and beneath the earth has been given unto me, therefore you go. He was saying, Take the dominion and authority I got back that Adam lost over all of the, the natural realm and the spirit realm. That's why the Bible says, What you bind is bound, what you loose is loosed. We need to learn to use our dominion and authority. Amen? So what happens is, our words really begin to determine 
God's actions toward us. And that's pretty powerful when you think about it. Our words determine God's actions toward us. Wow. And that's what we're reading here. All right. God allows whatever you allow. What do I mean by that? Well, if you decide you're going to go out and rob a, a, a liquor store or something, God will not stop you. If you decide to do that, he will let you do it. But you'll pay the price. And that's sad because God already paid the price through Jesus. Amen? But he'll let you do whatever you want to do. You don't want to go to church? He won't force you to go to church. You don't want to read your Bible? He won't force you to read your Bible. You don't want to confess or declare the Word of God over your life? He won't force you to do it. You'll hear people preach like me. You'll hear the Holy Spirit will speak to you and try to motivate you and get you to begin to do some of these things, but God won't force you to do it. Uh, I know people who say, well, I don't believe in tithing, you know. Well, they haven't read their Bible then because it's the Old and New Testament. It was before the law, during the law, and after the law. It's still current today. But they say, I don't believe in tithing. Well, God doesn't pin them down and, and grab their wallet or their checkbook and take the money from them and force them to tithe. No, God allows what you allow. He puts you in charge. Say, oh, God's in charge of my life, you know. A lot of Christians, that is not true. God is not in charge of their life. They're in charge of the life. And the only way God gets to have any authority over you is what you give him. So you give it to him by moving in faith and by doing what the word says. Amen. All right, let me go to the next page on notes here. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45, the second part of verse 11. It says, concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. Oh, what in the world does that mean? Concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. That's that going back to the dominion and authority that God gave Adam in the garden. There's our pattern right there. Have dominion. Have, subdue the earth and have dominion and authority over it. Use its resources. The whole idea was that God gave a pattern of the garden to Adam and Eve. And Adam's job was to expand that pattern throughout the rest of the world. And he didn't do it. Man had dominion. Man had authority. The devil stole it. Adam gave it to him. But Jesus got it back. All right? So, going along with this idea that God is, is in a sense, God has restricted himself from doing beyond what you believe him for. And if you don't believe him for it, there's not much he can do. Now, once in a while we say, well, you know, I was in the hospital, I was unconscious, and God healed me. But somebody was praying. I got news for you. The things don't happen without some faith being involved. So somebody somewhere was praying for you if that happened. All right. Matthew 18, 18, Verily I say unto you, now listen to this, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound or what is bound in heaven. Another translation says it more that way. Whatever you bind on earth is what has already been bound in heaven. In other words, you have the authority to bind on earth what God has bound from heaven. Well, there is no poverty in heaven, no lack, no want, no sickness, no disease, no death. There's no anger, no hatred, no unforgiveness. All those things that God has bound from heaven, he doesn't allow them there, you have the right to bind them and not allow them into your life, into your family, your business, whatever it may be. And then the other side of that is, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth is what must be loosed in heaven or what has been loosed or allowed in heaven. So whatever God allows in heaven, you have the same authority to allow it here on the earth. But you notice it says that it's what you bind or what you loose, not what God binds and looses. We have to look at his pattern, what he does in heaven, and bring that into the earth in our actions and our words. Amen? All right. Now, remember, your words affect your results. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. A man's self shall be filled with the fruit or results of his mouth, which are your words, 
and with the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied, whether good or evil. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge it shall eat the fruit of it for death or for life. What power God has given you that your words have the ability to affect in your life, life or death, blessing or cursing. It's in your power. Is what you do with your words. You talk unbelief, you're going to get unbelief results. You talk sickness and disease, well, you know, I just seem like every time the, 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 the uh, seasons change, man, I, I get hay fever, I get the flu, I get this, I get that, and you get it every year. It's not because you have to, it's because you've been declaring it. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Uh, you know, the again, what he said here, uh, where was that? What verse was that? That was um, <clears throat> Proverbs 18, 20 through 21. A man's self shall be filled with the results of his words and with the consequences or the, the, the results of his words. He must be satisfied whether good or evil. In other words, your words determine the outcome. But if you don't have the word in you in abundance, chances are the words of faith are not going to come out of you when you need it. So, you, again, judge yourself, do something about it. Amen? Amen. Mark 11, 22 and 23. I can't believe how fast the time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, Mark 11, 22. Jesus, answering the disciples, saith unto them, Have faith in God, literally translated, Have the faith of God. Have the faith of God. How do you do that? Have the, how do I get God's faith? Faith is of God. The Bible says when you got born again, there's been dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not a measure. See, I didn't get a bigger measure than you. We got the same measure. It's what you do with it that determines the results. So there's been dealt to every man the measure of faith. You've got faith. It's in there. It's a seed. But seeds have to be planted, they have to be watered, they have to be nourished, weeds have to be pulled. It's as we meditate and do the Word of God, we make our declarations of faith, that we're feeding that seed, and it begins to grow, and it begins to increase. And one day, you can become a person of great faith. And we know that because the disciples rebuked them for their lack of faith, their littleness of faith, and then compliment them for their great faith at different times, different situations. So what do you want to be? You want to be a person of little faith? You want to be a person of no faith? Or you want to be a person of great faith? The results are up to you. It's not up to God. Amen? Now, we go on then. After he says, have the faith of God, verse 23, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So there, I mean, we, we, we see the results. If you have the faith of God, then you can say. One translation says, if you had faith, you would say. If you had faith, you would say. Say what? Well, here he's talking about moving a mountain. Say, so, oh, that's just, uh, you know, that's illustration. That's not real. No, there was a mountain there, just like the tree that dried up. It was a real tree. And, and he's literally saying, if you had faith, you would say to this mountain, be removed, cast into the yonder place, doubt not in your heart, but believe that the things you say will come to pass. You will have whatsoever you say. You notice he only talked about believing once. He talked about saying or speaking three times. Three times more power than just believing by, your, by itself. We need to begin to declare God's word in our situation. Well, I don't know what the word says about, you know, this or that. Get in the word and find out. Study the word. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and show you where the answers are. If you, if you got a church where the word's going forth, they're teaching the word, go to your pastor and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm trying to find a scripture that deals with this. Do you, can you give me a scripture? And, of course, most pastors, 
spend time in the Word, and hopefully they'll be able to come up with a, a word for you, scripture for you, that will deal with the situation that you've got to deal with. Amen? Amen. All right, got about 10 minutes left. So let's give me give me some more. Let me give you some more things to remember. Uh, we would need to remember that being offended and unforgiveness will hinder your faith. Being offended and unforgiveness will hinder your faith. Mark eleven, verse uh, Mark chapter eleven, verse twenty five. We were just there. The verses we just read. So he's going on and talking, and he says, Whenever you stand praying, if, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. Now, I know in one place it says, if you have offense, you ought to go to your brother and, and you know, basically confront him and talk it out. But you know what? That's, that's really a challenge, because now you might offend them. And, and you may not ever feel satisfied in the situation, but when you just by faith forgive, that's the end of it. That's the end of the discussion. That's the end of the problem. From that point forward, you've got to treat that person like it never happened. I know that's hard to do. That's the emotions. That's the flesh. It's reason. But we're walking by faith. We're not walking by the natural areas, the natural realm. Amen? So he says, "Go uh, forgive him. Let it drop, leave it, and let it go. In order, now listen to the, the results, in order that your Father, who is in heaven, may also forgive you your failings and shortcomings and let them drop. In other words, we set in motion God's power to release us from the things we've done. See, that, that word forgive there also means to let go. So if we don't let go of that offense, because of what somebody said or did, then God is put in a position where he can't release us from the offense we committed. It's not God being mean. It's that God put it in your hands and told you what to do about it. If you don't do it, he can't act on his own. You say, well, he's God. But God operates by his word. That word is based upon principles, spiritual laws. And if we don't operate the spiritual laws based on what the Word says, we don't get the Word results. If God says do it this way, let's not try to rewrite the Bible or reinvent our faith. Let's do it God's way. It's really much simpler. Hallelujah. All right. So, verse 26 says, now listen again. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive or let go concerning your failings and your shortcomings. He can't release you from the results of the situation you've created. The word forgive there, you know, let go, release. He can't let, he can't, it's not that God's holding on to it. it you know, he can't, <laughs> he can't just let it go in the sense that he can take it away and deliver you from what you've created unless you let it go, you forgive. Because the seed you sow will determine the harvest you reap in your own uh, situation. Sow seeds of forgiveness, you'll receive a harvest of forgiveness. Amen. You got to write that down. All right. So we got about six uh, minutes. Uh, I got a plug that's not working here. Let me see what's going on. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, anyway, well, we'll just keep on going. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to Matthew, and we'll probably close it up with this. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them and letting them go, and giving up resentment, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. It's very important that we learn to forgive. We learn to release people from that. Whatever they did, whatever they said, forgive them, let it go. Move on with your life. Don't keep on holding on to that unbelief, that anxiety, that unforgiveness, that 
oh man, I wish, you know, God would just, you know, get them or someday I got to set the record straight here. It's not going to happen that way. All right, I need to stop. So we're going to pick it up literally right there uh, next week. If this is helping you, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear a, a testimony uh, uh, how this has helped you in some way, and uh, that would be a blessing to me. Now, let me let me speak to everybody out there that's hearing this message. That if if you cannot answer this question positively, then you need to hear what I'm about to say. If you died today, would you go to heaven? Would you? If the rapture took place, for those of you who know what the rapture is, if the trumpet sounded and the rapture took place and all of us believers were caught up to be with the Lord, would you go? If you can't positively, absolutely say, yes, I would, I'm a born-again Christian, if you say things like, well, I don't know, I'm not sure, then you need to be born again. All right, how do you get born again? Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you believe in your heart, which is a choice you make. You've got to believe the word, believe the testimony. If you'll believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. That's an absolute. If you will pray a prayer and confess Jesus as Lord, you'll be saved. It's not works. It's not good works. It's not you know all the things you do or the giving you do. It's an act of faith, receiving something that you could never do for yourself. You could never pay for your sins but Jesus did amen so I want you to pray a prayer with me and I want to give you a free book father pray this prayer for me dear God in heaven I make the choice tonight to believe that you raised Jesus from the dead and I believe that Jesus died for my sins and was raised from the dead so Jesus I ask you to come into my heart I ask you to become my Lord my Savior, and I submit my life to you, and I receive you, and I declare that I am now born again, I'm a child of God, because the Word has declared this, and I receive it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, it doesn't matter how you feel. You may feel all excited inside, and you may feel like you're a new creation. Some people feel that way. You may not feel a thing. You may not feel like anything changed. You may have no emotion whatsoever. But the fact is, God's word is true. If you prayed that prayer with me, you're born again. Don't let the devil steal it from you. Don't let anybody else steal it from you. You're a child of God. Now, one of the things I want to do is give you a book that will help you to understand more about that. And it's called Welcome to the Family. It's got some very basic, important things you need to know. If you prayed that prayer... You, you're now born again. You'd like to have this book. All you got to do is email me with your name and address. Tell me, Pastor, I got born again on this night, uh, uh, September 15th. And uh, please send me the book. I'll send it to you free of charge. And, uh, you know, you'll receive that in the mail in you know, about a week or so after you request it. So please let me know. that The email address is wemmons one at gmail.com. So that's w for William, Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S, and the number 0 and 1 at gmail.com. If, uh, if you want to give to this ministry, so see, become a partner. Not only is that email address good for contacting us, but that's our PayPal email address, and you can give to this ministry through PayPal uh, by going on going to PayPal and, and entering the same email. And uh, if you do that, Make sure to use the friends and family option when you give because that will eliminate their fees and we get the full benefit of what you give. Now we are believing God for 100 partners and if our ministry is blessing you and helping you in some way, pray about becoming a partner with us. We don't ask you to do a certain thing just as long as whatever you decide to do, you're faithful to it and do it on a monthly basis. That's what helps us be able to do things that God's called us to do. So partnering with us means it's it's like you coming, taking hold together, arm in arm, and together we go out there and we fight the devil and we heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and teach the word. It's as if you're there with us doing that. You're a partner. You give us the ability to do these things. So we appreciate our partners and we thank every one of you that are partners with us for doing that and being faithful to it. 
especially in these times that we're living in. Uh, also, if, if you got a Venmo account, you can give through Venmo. Look up William Emmons. Uh, make sure you see my face. Uh, if you want to give by check, you can send it in the mail to Post Office Box 4238 West Hills, California, 91308. Uh, if you want to give by debit or credit card, we can do that too. We use Square, but we'll have to ask you to send, uh, use, use, email us your credit card information, uh, make sure the name that's on the card you include, make sure the, the three number uh, code is on the back, make sure we get that, the expiration date, and the zip code for the mailing address for that card. Once we run that card, we'll delete it from our uh, computer, and it won't be in there for anybody to try and steal it. You know, we don't want that to happen. So we love you guys. We appreciate you. Uh, if you give, uh, and I, I just want to bless you with something. If you give $10 or more, I want to send you a CD. It's a healing CD with healing scriptures, original anointed music to back it up. Many people have been healed through this CD, which is what I recorded. We also have a prayer cloth that we've anointed, laid hands. We have scripture references for that on the front of this card. It comes with it in a pack like this. Uh, if you give $25 or 20, I think it's $20 or more, we'll give you one of these as well. We're not trying to sell you anything, but we want to cover the costs that we have involved in getting those to you. So we love you guys. Have a blessed week. Join us Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for a Sunday morning service. We'll have a time of worship and ministry, and we'll give you some more good teaching on the Word. And uh, I've been teaching on the end times, the last days. Uh, we're, we're dealing with some other issues right now, but join us, and we will see you then.